Hello, my friends, and welcome to Worship with Spearfish United Methodist Church. Spearfish is located on the far western edge of South Dakota, on the far northern edge of the Black Hills, and it is a joy to welcome you in. This month, we have been looking at the Ten Commandments much more in depth and looking how the first four commandments were all based on relationship with God. But today, we explore what does it mean to be in relationship with each other. Honor your father and honor your mother. What does that mean? And how do we do that? What's the power of it today? So, what I want you to know is that what we're exploring today is the fact that God has given us a gift. It is the gift of the commandments, not something that is forced on us that we are forced to do, but rather a gift that invites us into full human relationship, full relationship with God. All right, my friends, bow with me. Let's pray. Gracious God, I give you thanks for this time of worship and ask that you would move hearts and open minds. Lord, teach us something new today. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Okay, my friends, let's worship. I want to invite you, the, the Old Testament lesson tonight is only one verse, so we get to read it together. Join me. Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, we're going to speak that again, but before we do, I want you to begin asking questions. Honor your father and your mother. Wait a minute, what, what if I don't have a father and mother anymore? Or what if I never did? Well, what if my father and mother are jerks? Because we know these people. We, we know bad parents. Do I still have to honor them? So that I may live long in the land? What does that have to do with anything? Be sure to be asking questions of yourself. Be sure to be noticing these things that we just gloss right over. Let's speak it again. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. I want to invite you to join together in prayer. And as we have done in previous weeks, I want to invite you, if you are worshiping with someone, to simply put this on pause and to spend a few minutes with each other in prayer. So I would invite you to simply turn this off, to ask each other, what would you like me to pray for? When you are ready for prayer, you can just come right back into this video, or you can pray for each other without the video. If you do that, one person could pray, or you can pray for each other, or you can simply spend some time in silent prayer. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly God, I give you thanks. I give you thanks for the gifts that you have given us, those gifts that are found in the commandments. And so we give thanks for your power, your presence, your strength in our lives and in our world. We give you thanks that you have carved out from all of the chaos moments of Sabbath for us. And today we give you thanks for the families that are the core of who we are, for the families that are our mothers and our fathers, but so much more than that, our grandmothers and grandfathers, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, our brothers, our sisters. Lord, we give you thanks and ask that you would help us to love each other, to respect each other, and to listen to each other, and to help. Gracious God, we ask that you would help us to honor the core that is our family, whether that family is all blood relationship or just friendships that are so incredibly powerful that they form family. Lord, we give you thanks for all of these. We pray this day for our church, we pray this day for our communities, especially for those within our congregations, families, and friendships who are dealing with COVID. Gracious God, we pray for health and healing and strength. We pray for those who are working in our hospitals, asking that you would give them strength to meet each day. Lord of love, guide us that we might always be your people. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. I want to invite you to pray together our Lord's Prayer. From 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 31. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one b body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? 
Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Love is indispensable, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. All right, I want to invite you to be pulling out your GPS, your Grow, Pray, and Study Guide, especially in these Christian basics like the Ten Commandments. The more that we can encourage you into study and to actually dive into Scripture to see how to get a, a deeper understanding, the better. We always have sermon notes in here. I want to encourage you to be writing and, and taking on those also. Okay. Would you bow with me? Let's take a, a moment of silence to focus. Amen. Can we talk about your parents? It doesn't matter were your parents the best parents in the whole world or the worst parents in the whole world. Did you lose your parents when you were young or did you keep your parents until you were old, old, old? Can we talk about your parents? The power of parents, the power of, of family and what that means inside of our lives. So tonight we dive into this, this commandment, commandment number five. Now, commandment number one, you will have one God and one God only. Commandment number two, no idols. Commandment number three, do not misuse the name of God. Commandment number four, honor the Sabbath. All four of those are the rock solid foundation that are relationship with God. This is the very first one that is all about relationship with people. What does it mean to be in relationship with people? Now, interestingly, when we jump next week into number six, now we get into some really short ones. Don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat. But this one, the wording is absolutely fascinating. Honor your father and your mother so that your life may be long, living in the land being given to you by the Lord your God. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. What, what did that, uh, why did, would we have something on this so that you can live in the land that was given to you by God? Let's examine families. A family today, you know, isn't it fascinating? It would be tempting to be able to say a, an American family is a mom and a dad, a son and a daughter, 2.3 kids, a dog and a cat. But of course, that's not accurate. We can find those families and we have multiple of those families here within our church, and we have multiple of those families here within our community, but you know the variations on this. We have families that, that are a single parent, a mother or a father. We have, we have families where the parents are gone and children are being raised by their grandparents. We know children, we know families that have one child. We know families that have no children. We have no families who have a ton of kids, seven, eight, nine, ten. We know families that are just parents and children, but we also know families that are expanded, that are grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. We know families who are living here in the Spearfish and Northern Hills areas, well, and we know families that are scattered to the winds, and they can be living as, uh, across the globe. How do you define a family? Isn't it interesting? There is no one definition. I want to compare a family today with a family four or 5,000 years ago, back when these commandments were first written, first spoken. 
In order to do that, I want, to, I want to take us back in time. Now, remember, these commandments were not written down first. They were spoken. They were passed on orally to family and community. So uh, let's look at what a family would have been like 5,000 years ago. Let's see. Let's begin by saying what it was not. Let's take away technology. A family 5,000 years ago had no telephone, no, t no radio, no, uh, no television, no computers. There were, there were no lights at night. You might have had a lamp, but there was no such thing as a street lamp, as a farm light. Let's take away hospitals, medical community, technology, common metal alloys like steel. None of that existed. If you wanted to make anything, you didn't go down to the store. Those stores didn't exist. You made it yourself or you traded for it. What was it like? There were no paved roads. Even the, even the Roman Empire, it was still thousands of years from existence. It was all dirt paths, dirt roads. There were trading routes. But inside of communities, families tended to stay much more nuclear. Now today, when I use the word nuclear family, what I am saying is, here is parents and kids. Boom. There we go. That is, that is typically what our families look like. There was no such thing 5,000 years ago. They would have looked at you and said, what do you mean you only have parents and kids? No, 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 no. Families were intergenerational, powerfully intergenerational. And so it was common to have grandparents, great-grandparents. Not only this, inside of the Jewish tradition, which of course is where our verses come from, it was very patriarchal. It was the grandfather, whoever was the oldest grandfather, that was the one who ran the family and made sure that everything was functioning. And each generation of fathers down inside of that were the ones who held the authority. Now, of course, we would disagree with that. You know, we would say, yes, but women have right. Yes, we say that today, but not then. Everything was held in place by this patriarchal system that did not move around. You didn't move to New York and back and then to Washington State and back. No, you stayed. They say that, that Jesus himself was never more than 40 miles away from the place that he was born. Fascinating. Fascinating. We stayed put. Now, let me speak that, uh, that word again. Kevin, could, could I actually ask, could you quick flip back and actually pull that commandment up? All right, would you read this for me so that we can look at the de details? Read it with me. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. If you would just keep that up there. All right. Honor your father and your mother. It doesn't say specifically, unless they're horrible people. It simply acknowledges this is our family. And 5,000 years ago, your family structure was your family structure. There was no escaping it. This is who you are. This is who you live with. And honor was absolutely expected. There had to be respect inside of that family structure. Now, it's, it's more complicated today in how we handle that and how we do that, but I want you to be thinking, how is it that we honor our parents? Can we talk about your parents? Now, for some of you, you will say, for instance, my mom has, has been dead for a number of years now, and you can say, well, I don't, how can I honor my parents if they're gone? 
and to say, wait, 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 I can, I can honor memory. And so one of the ways that I honor my mother is I remember her and I remember the wisdom that, that she was able to give me and I remember her laugh. There's lots of different ways that we can remember and honor the parents that have gone before us even years and years ago. So that you may live long, live long, live long, live up. The hope was that you would live for a long time. In order to do this, it meant that you were safe, stable, healthy, and strong. And you could not do that without your family. The family was the social structure. It was the safety net that held you in place. If you got sick, if you had an accident, there was no one to go to. It was your family that was right there to help you recover. If something went wrong, it was your family that was there to give you the resources, to give you the assistance, whatever it took for you to make it through and to survive inside of that moment so that you may live long. In the day when these commandments were given, family was absolutely the bedrock and the only way that you could hold society together, the only way that you could live long, the only way that you could live on the land, on the land, on the land, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. I want you to notice two things. First of all, it's assuming that, that there was land. So that you may, it doesn't say that you own the land. At this point in time, there were a lot of nomadic people, but it was still assumed that you had access to the land. Who had current access when this commandment was written? Who had access to the land? In that patriarchal system, the one who had the access was the father. If, they, if the father owned property, then he was the one that held the deed and, and kept that property safe. And that property was handed from father to son to father to son to father to son for hundreds of years. There was a stability. The entire system was built and created so that there could be a stability inside of the system so that you would always have a place to be, so that you would always have someone to call home. Now, did they have tensions in their families? Absolutely. Families always have tensions. This is true today, and this was true 5,000 years ago. There's always the tension, but inside of that tension, they learned how to live together. Now, what if the family was nomadic? What if they just kept moving and moving and moving? They still, it was the father who had the relationships. He knew the maps. He knew where the water was. That was how they kept access into the land. But there's the second part that the Lord your God is giving you. Ultimately, who owned the land? Not the people. It was God's land. It was God's land. This commandment is not some hard, fast, difficult rule. This commandment was a gift. Absolutely a gift that said, if you want to thrive... If you want life to be good, then your family needs to be good. First commandment, second commandment, third commandment, fourth commandment, honor God. Fifth commandment, we move from God into family. If you wanted life to be good, you had to honor the family as well as honoring God. And this was not a commandment that you were forced to keep. This was a gift. You want life to be good? There it is. Well, how would you, how would you interpret that? How would you deal with that today? Here we are, as, 
as time went on, as the millennia passed, I mean, remember, even when Jesus was, was alive, these commandments were already thousands of years old. They figured out that there were some different ways to deal with this. So for instance, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, the body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. We are all baptized into that one body. What would happen if I would use another word for the word body? What if I would use family? The family is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts and though all its parts are many, they form one family. I think back to the times inside of my families where life was difficult and tensions were there and and what did it take to work through those and how did we learn to be family together? The body, the family is one unit and we have to figure out. And later then in that passage, Paul goes on to say, look, the eye cannot say to the ear, I don't need you. The hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. We cannot say to each other inside of our families, I don't need you. The fact of the matter is we are family and and it's difficult sometimes to learn to walk in and through that tension. But this is who we are. I want you to picture the family, your family, as a body. One part, many parts. Now, fascinatingly, this is not just about the family that is still alive. What about the family that was here 100 years ago and 200 years ago? The family that went before you and made you who you are. Your genetics, your environment, your situation. We get to share together to figure out how is it that we as family are supposed to be together, bound together. I want to suggest to you tonight three ways, three simple words, respect, listen, help. They're three verbs. How is it that we honor our fathers and our mothers? How is it that we honor and strengthen our families? Now, remember, sometimes our families are our blood relationships. They are our brothers and sisters, our our grandparents, our grandkids. They are related to us by blood. But sometimes the families that are most powerful in our lives are not related by blood at all. They are related by friendship and relationship. You get to define what that family looks like. You get to choose what family it is that you are honoring. Because the point is, it's not the family that's dead and gone. It's not the family that lives halfway across the globe. It's the family that is today that keeps you together. It's the family that helps you function. It's the family that gives you health and safety and strength. When we say honor your father and honor your mother, we are saying honor the core of your family so that life can be good as God would have it be good. Three verbs, respect. How is it that we can learn to respect each other inside of our families? I had a fascinating funeral once. This was a woman in Huron that that I didn't know at all until I was called in. And she was was on hospice, she was dying on hospice, and so I, I had the opportunity to get to know her before the funeral, and she really wanted that. And I began to notice that there were some real tensions inside of her family. Fascinatingly, about a week before she died, she gave me a letter and she said, I want you to read this and I want you to know it and to read it word for word at my funeral. I tried to find the letter. I know it's in my files somewhere. But in effect, what the letter says is, 
My dear family, you know that for years that we have had tensions together. You know that for years, many of you have disagreed with the way that I have raised my children. And you know how difficult this has been and the journey that we have all been on. And here is the one sentence that I remember. That was a direct quote from that letter. She said, I done the best I can. I done the best I can. It was amazing how healing that letter and that sentence was to the rest of her family. It didn't correct the problems. It didn't go back into history and make things all better. But it did give them a moment of explanation to say, oh, wait a minute, is that what was going on? Because there were things that were happening under the surface of the family that nobody knew about. They did not know about the addiction issues that her children wrestled with. They did not know of the discipline issues that came out of that. They did not know. And now in her letter, as she was able to simply explain what she had not been able to explain, and to simply say, i done the best I can. What came out of that letter and out of that funeral was respect. How is it that we can look at our family, at our parents, at our grandparents, or maybe it's our kids, and, and the generations go the other way. How do we look at our family and respect? And to say, I don't agree with you, but I think Perhaps there are things that I can learn to respect in you. This is the first invitation that I want to give you, is learn to respect the core and the leadership of your family. And if you are that leadership, if you are the matriarch, the patriarch, then how do you respect the family around you? The second word is this. It's, it's listen. Listen. You know that I go out into the community all the time and help with funerals. And I love doing this. This is, this, this is incredibly powerful. There was a funeral that, that I did that was one of the most difficult of all. And the hardest funerals are, children, are, are funerals for children, specifically babies. There was a miscarriage. In, in, my, in my church, it was a stillbirth. And, and what that means is that this pregnancy went full term and at the moment of birth, when they thought this was going to be a live child, this was a stillborn child who was dead. Some of you have experienced this and it is just nothing but difficult. With that family, I observed as I, was, as I was with them and walking with them through that amazing grief, just that overwhelming grief, mom and dad had both of their parents living in the same community. All four grandparents were right there. And it was in that moment that both of their mothers said to them, well, you know, when I had my miscarriage, and this mom and dad said, what? What? You had, you each had a miscarriage? And it was absolutely shocking. It was the first time that anyone had heard this. Why? Why? Because we were in a German farming community and you didn't speak about that stuff. Years ago, decades ago, generations ago, when these things happened, you didn't speak of them and no one was there to listen. To listen. I want to encourage you with your family as you seek ways to respect each other, listen to what is going on in their lives. I have a two and a half year old granddaughter 
And when she comes up and speaks to me, she is speaking to me of things that really matter, even though in my grandpa's eyes, eh, those are just tiny little things and they don't matter. Oh, yes, they do. They matter to her. And this is what I'm inviting you into. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in this land that God has given us by respecting, by listening. The third verb that I want to give you is, is help. How do we help each other? How do we help each other? One of the things that is, is, is very, very strange, I haven't figured this out yet, is, is the issue of homelessness in the Northern Hills. One of the things that pandemic has done is triggered expanded homelessness. And one of the things that we are trying to figure out, not just in pastoral circles, in our communities, is how do we help? How do we realistically help? Now, what's fascinating is I don't have any answers on that. We're in process because a lot of this problem is still is, is happening right now. But what I do know is this, I want to help. So therefore, wait, there must be ways that I can help. How is it that I can tune who I am to simply know that there are ways to help? If we can listen in our community, how do we listen inside of our families? Honor your father and your mother by helping. Respect, listen, help. This is what I'm inviting you to as, as we together walk into this. Speak the commandment with me once more. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. God is still giving you that land. God is still giving you your inheritance. God is still giving you. May it be that you honor your father, honor your mother, live or in memory, that you honor your family, that you respect and listen and help that family core. This is what God is giving you, the gift that is the core of your family. May it be that you accept that gift, strengthen it, and take what God gives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you bow with me? So Lord, I want to give you thanks for the ways that you have moved within our lives and our communities and within our families. We pray tonight, Lord, for every family who is represented here that you would be the one who guides us, guards us, that you would be the one who gives us the wisdom so, Lord, open our eyes that we might see each other through your eyes, through the eyes of power and love. Lord, help us to be empowered to love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.